Times best-selling authors Christy Golden and Mickey Nilsson, uh, who is Blizzard's publishing lead. Uh, we will ask questions about World of Warcraft war crimes. Among the interviewers are Blizz Planet staff members Val Nimsil, Sarah Storer, and Ian Bates, also known as the Retro Guy. We'll now begin with the first question. Hi, Christy. Hi. Could you describe the first phone call from Blizzard asking you to write war crimes? I think it was email, actually. We usually communicate through email. And I do remember that um, I believe, Mickey, you sent that one to me. Probably. And um, they proposed, they told me the idea that they wanted to do, and um, they said they wanted to work with me on developing the, the outline. Sometimes the outline comes complete from Blizzard. And sometimes we all get together and kind of hash it out. And this time we were, were getting together to hash it out. And I remember thinking, wow, this is a really, really cool idea. I don't know of anything like this that's been done before. And um, I just was very excited because I knew it would be um, an awful lot of interesting possibilities and threads and story ideas. Okay, uh, can you discuss uh, who plays the role of defender and prosecutor and why you chose these two? We have Bane with the thankless task of trying to defend Garrosh. And um, we end up with having Tyrande um, being essentially a prosecution, which is accuser in the terminology that we use for the book. And uh, it's a, it was a little sneaky of the Alliance. They originally fronted Varian, and Varian got vetoed. So then they were able to get Tyrande, who was going to be much more, I think, uh, hard-nosed than Varian at least the very end as he is now would have been. So the Horde might have had, might have done better to have stuck with uh, with Varian. Some time ago, you mentioned this story isn't about Garrosh. Who are the central? Which characters are the central focus of war crimes, and why? You know, I think if you want to take the big scope, which was what, of course, the Celestials are doing, um, it's not just Garrosh. It's everybody. It's everybody, and the point of the trial is for many, many story arcs are wrapped up here or examined and gently laid to rest, um, and a lot of people go on their own journeys here. So it's not just Garrosh, who is one of the main characters. It's several characters that we have followed for many, many years, and this trial uh, pretty much brings out all the skeletons in the closet and all the ways of looking at things. And so my hope was that it would feel like a journey of not just one character, not just the main character who's on trial. And I think the cover art was brilliantly designed to reflect that. That's one of the best covers I think I've, I've ever seen. And it does such a great job of setting the stage to the, the fact that this is a multi-character book with many different arcs. Did Blizzard's creative team pitch some ideas to you? Did you bounce ideas back? Uh, was there a brainstorm session to build the blocks that shaped war crimes? The basic idea was conceived by Blizzard, and Mickey has a, an interesting backstory angle on that, so I'll let him take this one. Yeah, so it was me, uh, me, Metzen, and Dave Kosak, uh, you know, just sitting in Metzen's office and trying to figure out what the story for the next uh, bridge novel would be. And we talked about all kinds of things. One of the things we talked about was Garrosh being kind of hunted down, uh, tracked down by Varian and Thrall. Uh, and, you know, in that, in that scenario, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't in chains. He wasn't captured. He was loose. Uh, but then we kept talking, and, and we explored more ideas, and we thought, okay, well, what if he is captured? He has not escaped, um, and what if what if we built a book around the trial that's taking place? And the more we talked about that, the more we 
got excited about it because we realized that that was something that had not really been done uh, anywhere that we could think of, especially the way that we started to to talk about executing on that. And and once we had that that uh, premise in place, then we contacted Christy and, and brought Christy on uh, because we knew that she would do a fantastic job, uh, especially because this is so built around the characters. And and Christy, uh, you can you can take it from there. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. We um, got to do one of my favorite things in life, which is to hang out at Blizzard HQ and have a great jam session with some extremely creative minds. Um, I, I love that. I love getting to interact with the Blizz folks and pounding out these ideas. And it's just so exciting to, in retrospect, look back on those meetings and say, yeah, I remember when Chris had the idea of this, or Mickey said this, or, or Dave told us about this quest chain. And um, so it was, it was great. It's always fun to, to sit down and uh, co-create with uh, Blizzard. Awesome. So, so Christy, my question for you is, is, how was it decided that a trial was going to be the best approach to introduce Warlords of Draenor? Uh, so it wasn't necessarily that it would be the best way to represent Warlords as much as it was an opportunity to answer several questions and set up warlords so we knew that by the end of the book and i'm not i won't give anything away for people who haven't read it but we knew we knew what the ending of the book was going to be and we knew that the ending of the book was going to set up uh where players are going to be going uh in in the game so in the meantime though we had an opportunity to really dig into several marquee characters uh, and to take a look back at kind of how we've all gotten here uh, and and everything that Garrosh has done and kind of remind people who Garrosh is and why he does what he does and thinks the way he thinks um, and and we were also able to explore a fantastic uh, theme in the book, which is that even though Garrosh is certainly guilty of, of all these many crimes, uh, no one is innocent. And so it, it was a way to really, uh, really dig into that theme, which we were all very excited about. How did you keep the story coherent with so many characters and historical moments? Um, that's a great question because there are a lot of things that we wanted to sh say and showcase. And um, I've done a multi-character book before uh, with The Shattering. It was my first um, effort to do that with a Warcraft book. And um, so one of the things that I actually did, because as a writer you want everything to have good pacing and good balance. Um, so one of the things I did was actually get out index cards, good old colored index cards, and each color was a different plot thread. And I laid them out on my dining room table so I could see when it was time to shift the attention to one thread and make sure that everything was moving on together, as it were. So yes, that was a, a big challenge for me. One of the highlights of the novel for many people are the flashbacks that we see via the vision of time. Were there any scenes or flashbacks you wanted to or had planned to include but got cut for whatever reason? Um, I don't think there was anything that got cut, but initially, you know, wow, it's so much to choose from. So I let the charges that were levied against Garrosh, which come from actual charges, um, and where we got the term crimes against humanity was, of course, Nuremberg, and I let the charges dictate which scenes came. I wanted to make sure that I had something really striking and gripping and, and dramatic for each of the charges that was levied against Garrosh. And so um, at the beginning, it was kind of like an embarrassment of riches. But once I had a guideline, which was, does this serve the theme of war crimes, then it became a lot easier to narrow down specifically which scenes to pick. There is a scene where Garrosh kills from Gar in some Taylor Mountains for bombing the Druids. Yet Garrosh bombs Teramur and he at least is given the right to have a trial. There is an irony somewhere in there. What was your motivation to use that scene in, in the trial? Um, Theramore 
was really, the whole bombing of Theramore was really striking to me because we have a scene actually in game where Garrosh punishes, indeed kills, somebody for doing pretty much exactly what he ends up doing. And the contrast between the Garrosh then and the Garrosh now, and especially also of how deeply, profoundly that affected, that wiped a whole city off the map. That's a big deal. And so, again, we're looking for things that do double duty. So to be able to compare Garrosh's actions uh, before and then currently um, with Jaina and how it affected her as well as everybody else who was involved with Theramore, the repercussions of that, um, that was a really key scene. And that was one of the ones we knew we did have to have in the book. Zayla, Shokia, Thalen, and Haramizer make a great villain team and were actually one of the most pleasant surprises in War Crimes. Do you think we'll see more of them, either in your own writings or in-game? Well, I certainly had a blast writing them. I mean, you know, you, you want to, it, it was almost, it was actually comic relief. You know, you put a goblin in and you're going to have a laugh. So I love writing goblin dialogue. And um, I gathered them, I got some suggestions for Blizzard, and then I actually ran across Haramizer in-game. And I was like, oh, I got to put him in. So, uh, yeah, they were a great, uh, great foursome and such differing personalities. I would be more than happy to work with them again. I don't know about anything coming down the pike for sure, but I certainly enjoyed writing those scenes. I have a question from Natora who sent us this. What could you say about the conflict between Garish, Sylvanas, and Jane Greyman concerning the nation of Gunias? Yeah, that was um, one of the plot threads that we did not feel helped the main storyline, which was the trial, as well as character development, as well as et cetera, so forth. There was, you know, this book could have been huge. If we had wanted to, we could have addressed so many different plot threads and storylines. And so it was hard picking and choosing, um, certainly for... For some of the crimes that he was charged with, you could find five different examples of it, for instance. But we really tried to just narrow things to, to certain characters and certain events that we thought would really serve the book best. And that was unfortunately one of the plot threads that uh, we decided early on um, not to pursue. Um, to run the list of several war crime charges against Raj, uh, could you dis discuss some of them? Ooh, let's see, off the top of my head. Um, they're listed in one of the excerpts. Um, you know, forcible movement of population, um, the uh, kidnapping of children, genocide, um, targeting uh, sites that, that were not deemed as military necessities for, for war. Um, forced pregnancy was a big one and a very hot topic when that came out. Um, so yeah, there, there's 10 of them, and they are all real-world crimes that we did see reflections of in-game. Awesome to hear. Um, so, being Bloodhoof has been a key character in most of your recent Warcraft novels um, since the Shattering and onward. Have you grown attached to Bane on a personal level? I'm very fond of Bane. Um, when I started working with him in the Shattering, um, he really didn't have that much character development. We knew his backstory, but we didn't really have a personality for him other than, you know, you assumed he'd be a pretty cool guy because we knew Karen and Karen was a cool guy. Um, so I really got to develop his personality and figure out a voice that I could listen to when I was uh, writing for him. And so I've, I've really become very fond of him and I identify a lot with him with the loss of his father. And he, I, I think he's what I like to call in a book a good traveling companion. I believe when you're reading a book, you, you are almost on a journey with the characters, and you want to have good traveling companions. They don't necessarily have to be um, the best people in the whole world, but they have to be comfortable and entertaining, and I think Bane serves that purpose. At one point during the trial, Tyrande requests the removal of Bane from the case. How far is Tyrande willing to go in order to win? And are there any immediate or future repercussions with her tactics as the accuser? Hmm. I think Turanda, as is evidenced by what she did in that particular scene that you reference, she wants Garrosh dead. And she's been charged with doing, just as Bane has been, doing the very best she can to make sure that, that this orc receives what she and many others perceive as the only 
the only real, real justice. Everything else to her would just be ridiculous. And so I do not think she would stoop to anything uh, illegal or immoral. But if it's there, she's going to use it. And she is also prepared to see that from, from Bain. So she, I won't say she will stop at nothing. Um, but I think she will use every, every tool in, in, her, in, her, in her kit to make sure that she gets the verdict that she wants. How do you feel about time travel and other dimensions in Warcraft and the implications from the lore perspective? Mickey, I'm going to let you feel that because I basically follow what Blizzard tells me yes. on this. Um, okay. When you're cre dealing with time travel, you know, because it is all theoretical, there's many different ways you can go. But I think Mickey is better equipped to speak on that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly something that we've dealt with before. It's, it's not new uh, for this book. Um, Christy wrote about it uh, and, uh, and had a fantastic time kind of playing around with the different time ways and knows Dormu and, and everything else. And, of course, in the game, you've got the Caverns of Time. Um, so it's something that can be a lot of fun. It can be very challenging. And, of course, the biggest questions that come up when you're dealing with those kinds of things are, you know, are we dealing with uh, going back into real history? Are we, are we talking about an alternate timeline that we're going into? If so, what are the differences in the alternate versus the real? Uh, and so I just want to say to everybody, I don't want to give too much away, but if you read the book, uh, there, there are some answers in there, and then uh, also we're going to be doing a short story that is going to be put up for free on the website for everybody to read. Uh, and so people who have questions specifically about time travel issues, if you read the book and you read the short story, you should get those questions answered. This okay. one is... I'll try to make this as spoiler-free as possible. The August Steel's verdict, without giving it away, is quite odd, considering what Garrosh has done and what we know he's going to do in Warlords of Draenor. Do you think they'll regret their decisions, the Celestials, once we find out about the Iron Horde? Or do they? can they see into the future like some people have theorized, and do they want him to go to Draenor? We can't really comprehend how they think. And I think, I won't go so far as to say they see the future because honestly I don't know one way or the other but I do think that they are wiser than we are and they are unburdened by things that we are so they are actually uh, as impartial as impartial can be like how and, this, sorry like go ahead like how the destruction of the veil ended up helping the Pandaren in the long run exactly we're, see, we're mortals and most of us um, in, in Warcraft, uh, most of the, the races are short-lived. They're, they're not thousands of years old. Some of them are, but not all of them. And they're very immediate. And these are, are infinite creatures. And they, I think they see all ends. And what may seem very frustrating uh, may turn out to be, oh, got it. Um, but that's not based on anything that I know of Warlords. That's just my take on, on the characters. Mickey, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I would just say that they're, you know, we as mortals are short-sighted. They are not. So they have, they have a much bigger picture, and they have that wisdom. So even if it's, if it's not necessarily a matter of being able to, you know, look into a, a crystal ball and see what's going to happen, you know, 100 years from now, uh, they still they still have the long view, and that's built on the wisdom that they've accumulated over their lifetimes. Do any of you guys have uh, more questions? I do have one comment I want to make. Um, again, thank you so much for this opportunity, Christy. You did an amazing job with this once oh, thank again. Thank you. Um, and Mickey and Lindsay, you guys are doing an amazing job over there as well. So again, thank you guys so much for this. Thank you. Of course. Um, let's have one question. It was interesting how Thalen, as I mentioned, got revisited, but
but will we ever find out exactly what happened with Aethys and the rest of the Sun Reapers? 5.2 looked like it was building up to something, and there have been some talks about deleted content from sources, but we don't really have an answer to what exactly Aethys was doing. And this would have been a good time to bring it up. Was it considered? That's a Mickey question. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe, I don't remember in the discussions that we had for the book that we had talked about Aethys. Um, and I can't, I can't speak to anything coming up game-wise. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Christy, we didn't have those discussions uh, when we brought you in, did we? No, that was one of the, the plot threads that we decided not to pursue. Yeah. It'd be a good source for future faction conflict. Cool. A lot of people want to know. In the previous uh, expansions, uh, there has usually been like two different novels uh, to introduce the, the expansion. Are we going to see a, a new book sometime in the next month? Uh, we don't have anything to announce as far as a new book at this time. Uh, just the short story that I was talking about earlier that will go up for free on the website. Um, I would suggest that people read it because um, there's so many characters and so many references to the history that it's uh, going to be pretty a good refresher just kind of on who the Alliance and the Horde are and were and hopefully uh, are going to be. Um, and I think also it's a chance to hang out with some of your favorite NPCs and um, hopefully it's a, an interesting philosophy uh, conversation that you can have. Uh, any more questions, guys? I think that's about it from everybody. Okay. Well, thank you for doing this interview. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much for yeah. joining us today, guys. Yeah, for thank you support. very much for, for inviting us. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Until next time.